Live from Hollywood, California, in the fabulous Pepper Day Studios, where actors e-chat happens daily. Where thousands of guests and celebrities have been here, and today is no exception. Today's guest hails from the East Coast, but has been in Hollywood since the beginning of time. No, he's not the new Moa, Noah movie or, or Moses or someone like that, but might as well be because he knew everybody and still does in Hollywood. He's got a new book, he's got plays and productions going on, he's worked in television and film. Um, welcome, Michael St. John. Hey. Did I miss anything? Uh, from the beginning of time, you yes. said, oh my God, Mary Pippard and I, we had, did play <laughs> ball together. <laughs> You're originally from the East Coast. I'm originally from uh, Philadelphia. Right. Uh, outside of Philadelphia, Swarthmore, Morton, Westchester, ever heard of those places? Right. And uh, uh, that's uh, something I cannot forget because it was, it was my beginning to get interested in everything, the theater, music. Very famous people came through Philadelphia, and I was always there, you know, trying to meet them and talk with them, get advice, suggestions about survival in the industry. So you even knew as a child that um, you were not going to be staying in the city of freedom forever. You were headed to the land of fruit and nuts. Well, I thought I was headed uh, towards Broadway. <laughs> oh, you were headed the other direction. You just made <laughs> Hollywood was more fruit. New York was more nuts. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I guess I could buy Hello. off on that. Yes. So why, um, why did you decide to go here if New York was the original destination station? Well, after I graduated from Swarthmore High School, I had a scholarship uh, at uh, Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, and I was voted the uh, class president. I was the first Afro-American at that time in the 50s. Congratulations. Yeah. And, uh, uh, things didn't go very well because um, when we had a homecoming parade, uh, the girls of my class flanked me on all sides going down the main street and uh, some of the KKK members of Ooh. the area uh, decided that was not a, a very good thing to see happening at that time. This was in Indiana? Richmond, Indiana. And wow. uh, they stoned and they threw produce and they did all sorts of things there. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, but the, the class got me back to campus very quickly, and and the dean of the uh, of education, Dean Curtis, he hid me in his attic because he, he was afraid that they might be coming to the campus. So you were voted class president, and there was still that type of hostility. Oh, in the fifties, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, well, they the firebomb my they, they firebomb my my dorm room, and so uh, that's how I was. Uh, sent to Hollywood, on the Los Angeles to USC. And, uh... Paul, did they firebombed your dorm room? They said, okay, here, here's a... Well, the Dean Curtis said it wasn't a healthy thing to be there. Okay. Especially in that area. Right. And so he had a friend at uh, USC, so they made fast arrangements for me to leave there early in the oh, morning. Oh, my. And I was put in the back of a truck. So it was really that quickly? Oh, my... Oh, yeah, it was like the yeah, exodus. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was, it was quite a disturbing experience, I'll tell you. Now, is Richmond, where is that in relative to, like, Indiana or what section? I don't know where Richmond's at in Indiana. Is that the southern Bloomington, portion? near Bloomington. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. John yeah. Mellencamp came from. It was a beautiful campus, and the students were fantastic. And uh, um, I was received by, you know, the students, uh, obviously, because I was a class president, et cetera. But the townspeople, they were not used to having that kind of thing happening, on, especially on homecoming day with a black uh, a guy or student, you know, being marched down the main street, Market Street, and all the girls were holding my hand and arm, and you know, walking very proudly. Mm -hmm. And that's what, when that happened, that just changed my whole life, really. So this yeah. is early 50s or later 50s? Early 50s, like 1952. Okay, so 1952, you come out to USC. Life-changing event aside from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're in yeah. Hollywood instead of New York. Yeah. What was the big adjustment coming here? It was a tremendous nice uh, adjustment because uh, Los Angeles was like a, a paradise to me compared to back east. Because and uh, there's your USC yeah, Trojans. Trojans, and yeah. I was in the marching band to that with me. Really? Band. What instrument? Yeah. That made it exciting. Which instrument? I played the drums. I made a lot of noise. Okay. I still am making I a lot of noise. I played trombone, so I know about the <laughs> noise factor in, in bands over the years. But uh, SC, uh, to continue, 
That sea offered me uh, tremendous opportunities in music and the theater. Is that where you first started doing plays, or had you done them prior? I had done one play at the Hedgerow Theater outside of Philadelphia. It's a very famous theater where Helen Hayes and, and um, one of the Barrymores, I think John Barrymore, appeared there as well. Right. And I did a play called The Adamses, and it was a musical play. Which had nothing to do with the Adams family. No, it okay. didn't. I just wanted to add some clarity there. And, and that was exciting because Jasper Dieter, the head of the... Uh, the theater there, you know, he decided that I had something rather special. Oh, and look yes. who we have here. Oh, Helen Hayes, Miss Hayes, yeah. What and I met her, at, and when I finally got to Hollywood, I met her. Really? Uh, yes. And How was she in person? Lovely. Like a, like a, like a lie day, you know. She was wonderful. She was really quite warm and easy to to approach, unlike many stars of today, um, unfortunately. Stars of that era were different. They didn't oh, yes, have yes. all of the viral social media and on the cover of every produce Thanks, stand exactly. magazine. Exactly. Because I met uh, Bette Davis, so I can always say... I Betty met, Davis' eyes. Oh, my God. But Miss Davis, I met her, I think, in 54 or 56. And uh, she, was at, uh, she introduced me to uh, Jimmy Cagney and uh, a lot of her friends. And uh, Ronald Reagan was there. And here she is. Yeah. Wow, what a and, beautiful uh, she picture. She invited me to her house for tea. And How, why did she take such a liking to you? Because did you do a play together, or you well, just happened to randomly meet Well, her? I was talking to Ronald Reagan. He was the really? you know, he was the president of our Screen Actors Guild, remember? Yes. Uh, are you old enough to remember that? Thing? Uh, I, I, I have read the book. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes, well, I was talking to him, and my friend of mine who was with me, she says, Michael, do not act like Oh, look who we have here. Yes. James oh, my God, me. it makes me think about those times. It's, yes. just, it's just like yesterday. Anyhow, my, my friend says, Michael, do not act like a fool. Turn around slowly. When you were talking to Ronald Reagan. Yes, and I, and I turned around. There was Bette Davis, and I said, oh, my God, oh, my God. Miss Davis, Bette Davis, man. I ran up to her, and I said, I loved you all my life, because I was only about 18 years old. And I said, my, you're my, my star. You're the person I always watch. here is Ronald Reagan, who you oh, were referencing. Yes. Now, yes. was he a fiend of jelly beans even back then? He said to me, I complained about him. I said, uh, when are more people of color going to have better parts in films? He says, really? well, well, it takes time. <laughs> <laughs> that would say actually very well He says, done. after all, we got Sammy Davis. I said, Sammy Davis is not all black people. Exactly. Now, he said, yeah, but I understand, but be patient. You know. And this is when he's the president of Screen, Screen Actors, Actors Guild. Guild. And, you know, so Which year I, was this? Back in 50 I, I think 56, I think it okay. was. Yeah, because I had done a film. Oh, and here's that. Sammy. Yeah. And uh, it's too funny. I was and everything the was Candyman Sammy, you know. song this morning. Well, exactly, because I knew Sammy ran around with Alta Vista and all those guys, you know. And well, Alta Vista came later, but you know, my Britain and all that group of people. Right. And it was you know fascinating. But everything was Sammy, Sammy, Sammy. And when I did uh, Porky and Bess, but Sammy was in there playing Sport and Life, you know. And uh, it, it it just bothered me tremendously. That so, was an interesting time. It's not like it is today. Yes, it was a very interesting time. And for time. those who weren't around in that era, right. what were some of the hurdles to overcome? Just getting a decent part. They always wanted to be a Yaza boss and do the step and fetch it or the Willie Best. And I certainly, I came from Pennsylvania. I didn't know how to spell Yaza boss. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to spell it you know, really. either, even you know, today. Right. Yaza yeah. Boss? Yeah. How, how the yeah. heck do you spell and, that? And, and, and to get the part, I, I tried to make it happen with Otto Preminger. And I, when I went in to see Otto, uh, I was um, a little bit uh, aggressive. I was, uh, well, now, when you say aggressive, what do you mean? You like were not like the I was the now, best or? thing in Hollywood. Okay, so you were selling you. Yes. Okay. And I uh, went into his office. He was at 20th Century Fox Studios. I went to his office, and he says, "Why are you here?" I said, "Because I'm here because I'm the best actor you can possibly uh, hire for the role of T-Bone." Really? You know, I was going under a name. I'm a look at here he is. Oh my God! This frightens me just to see his picture. <laughs> Did he look like that? Oh, man? my God. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm the greatest actor in town. He said, I, he's like, we will see about that. Really? Um, and uh, and he, he looked at me. He was, I think he was amused because I had that enough guts or balls, you know, to sit there and tell him that things I really was not. I right. was not the greatest actor in town. I found that out. Oh, really? Yeah. But, but at the uh, time, my at that moment, and the you were. myself was, was there, you know. I, I, and he says, read this for me. I, I read it for me. He says, smile. He says, okay. I say, he, he says, you might be good for the part. I said, really? That's all I needed to hear. Right. I said, when are you going to call me? I need the contract right away. He says, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> what know, do you mean, pushy? Yeah, exactly, you know. So when the play, uh, when the film began to shoot, Dorothy Dandridge, Pearl Bailey, or Pearlie May, I called her, and Harry Belafonte called me a little shit. 
Wow. You know? <laughs> and then, because uh, I told his wife something which he didn't expect her to be at the studio, so I was always in trouble. Uh, Diane Carroll was there. She you was like okay. to stir it up, don't you? Oh, it was fun. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Olga James, Brock Peters, and uh, Dorothy Dandridge, of course, <laughs> you know. So we were all together. Talk about legends. You're just rattling them off like it's a phone book. Well, here. to me, that was my life. And These they were, were your my friends. Band, and they were my, like, my family again. Because we all lived together in Los Angeles because we couldn't live anyplace else. We couldn't live in Burbank or Glendale or Hollywood. Oh, so they were, we, we were clustered together on the east. Who do we have here? Diane yeah, Diane. Oh, oh, yeah, Diane. What a lovely yeah, picture. Yeah, it, it, now, why couldn't you live in all these other communities? Because they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't rent us a, uh, an apartment or, or a room or whatever. Now, is that the period because you were an actor? and you No, were, because you were this black period. So it was just you know? strictly a color boundary. Oh, it was, exactly. I used to walk down uh, Hollywood and I... Or, and I was called, you know, the N word several times by people. What are you doing here after 10 o'clock? Well, I couldn't go to, uh, to Glendale or Burbank because they would stop me and ask me why. And so I, uh, since I was at SC, I, you know, wow. I needed work and I wanted to get extra work, you know, part time work. And I, would, uh, they, I applied for a, a library job and they said you couldn't work here because the library closes at 10 o'clock. So it would be a problem. So it was a, it was a psychological problem. I was, you see, uh, it's happening with me, it's the thing that happened to me in Indiana with the KKK and coming to Los Angeles, having to face that kind of challenge was a bit much. Right. And I was wounded emotionally. and Because uh, you emotionally. didn't have that in the Philadelphia environment Not where in you Philadelphia. came from. Well, in, in Morton, we went to separate schools, but we lived side by side. Right. And of course, it changed later on in the 60s, but it was quite uh, a thing. But in Philadelphia, you, you could live wherever, you know, Chester or in the cities, but in small towns. That's right. where you had the problems. We still, in small towns, were separated in, in theaters. Uh, the Caucasians uh, sat in the center of the theater. We sat on the left or right uh, all to ourselves. Wow. I used to challenge that and sit in the center, and they would ask me to move all the time. So I, even at 12 or 13 years old, I was challenging these stupid, ignorant, backward rules that society had posed for me, you know? And I did. I guess from that point on, I just sort of, it didn't enhance my belief about trying to prove to the world I was just like everybody else. Was, well, it's interesting because some people would let those things deter them and become depressed or give up, you were someone who was I didn't take time through. to think about it. I, it, it was an, ob, uh, uh, an object uh, that I, it was an objective that I had to conquer, and I decided if I just moaned about it, it just doesn't help at all. So I decided to just keep on working, keep on ignoring it after I knew, I realized it was there, the pediment was there, so therefore what do you do, just sit on it and rest on it and cry about it? So I just, just, just decided to go out there and fight as best I can, learn as much as I can, to learn about music, acting, dancing, and, and, and get to, to, uh, to college and, and to, to show the world that, you know, I had a brain, which mm -hmm. was terribly important to prove to certain Certain people, you know, even to, uh, to 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 this day, we we have that problem of proving that we're just like everybody else. Not only me, but Latins and Mexicans and the pe other people who are different from uh, the dominant group uh, in power. You know, yeah. so those are things that you just never, never really forget. And even I uh, said, well, uh, Michael, you you seem to be. I'm okay, but I'm still that kid in Morton, Pennsylvania, having to prove. I'm constantly trying to write something, compose something, and, or, or to direct something, or produce something, because it's just who I, I feel that I was born to do. We have a question from one of our actors each other. Well, we have several. I think some of them that you have addressed. Um, Melissa wanted to know if when you came to Los Angeles, was it more open-minded? And someone else wants to know, so what kind of dancing did you do? Okay, it was open, very open, much more open-minded. Certainly than relative to oh, Indiana yes. experience, Well, I, yes. since I was on the campus at uh, USC, right. I was introduced to some of the greatest people in the world. I, I, uh, they, they knew, they found I could sing. And uh, uh, Ingolf, uh, Ingolf I'm a bass baritone. Okay. Yeah, Ingolf Dahl was one of the main guys over there. He introduced me to Stravinsky. I sang for, for uh, Dmitry Shostakovich and Marilyn Horn and I. And of course, Marilyn Horn and Jackie Horn, uh, she you know, is a diva of the Metropolitan Opera. Right. She was also the voice of Dorothy Dandridge in our film, Carmen Jones. So that was extraordinary, you know. And so they kept me busy singing, and I, I sang at the Hollywood Bowl for President Eisenhower. Oh, look who we have here. Yeah, and Jackie Horn, yeah. We had a lot of time drinking together. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back to talk more about your experiences of drinking and beyond and Betty Davis eyes you're watching actors e chat live from Hollywood I'm Kurt Kelly with Michael st. John back in a moment Michael st. John 
Betty Davis eyes. Oh, gosh. Tell me about them. Were they real? I mean, she actually helped you get into 20th Century Fox, oh, if my God. I remember correctly. I mean, yes, exactly. When I think of Bette Davis, I really as, as emotionally get to get the... So you don't think of the Kim Carn song she had? Bette oh, Davis no, because it's okay. much more there. To it's a real life thing. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean to you? Well, when, when, I, when she said to me that uh, she would like to talk with me, well, I asked, I asked her at the big party. I said, would you the mind? Big party? Is that... Well, that was at a screening. A okay. screening. I, read, I said, could I possibly talk with you sometime? She said, sure, of course. She says, you want to come to my house tomorrow? And I, I said, what? She said, do you have a pencil? I can give you my phone number. That did it for me. I went practically crazy. And I didn't have a pencil. I didn't have a piece of paper. So I ran all over the place. And I was uh, uh, to did try Did you put it in your cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> no one thought of inventing things like yes. that at that time. And I, and I said to everybody, the, the waiters, and I said, you have a pen or pencil? And I, no, no one seemed to have it. So you were like scrambling. Oh, yeah, and so, suddenly my guy popped up. He said, here's a pen, here's a pencil. So I ran towards Miss Davis, and there was someone that spilled a drink on the floor, and I fell to oh. the floor and slid all the way to her. I said, Miss Davis, I got a pen and a pencil. <laughs> oh, my God. She, she, she looked at and and she says, my God, yes, you do, Mr. St. John. <laughs> and so uh, she gave me her phone number. She said, would you call me tomorrow? And she gave me the time. I said, of course I will. And uh, I took her phone number down. And the next morning I called her at around 9 o'clock. And, and she says, oh, you come up to my house. And I said, where is it? That she was living in, uh, so where she had rented Anita Stewart's uh, house. Was, she's a silent film star right. behind the Beverly Hills Hotel. Oh. So I, I got up there. Secluded. I wasn't driving, and I had a little web cord. Uh, a what? Oh, the web cord tape recorder. It was oh. a big box type oh, of thing. And I got a taxi up there carrying this big tape recorder. Right. You know, with the, You're like, bringing luggage. It was metal rings. You know, oh, right? with the open reel tape. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Then we got into her, her sister, I think Barbara, answered the door, and I think she was playing the maid that day. And she asked <laughs> me to come on in, and I went into this marvelous bar and uh, the room that they had. And we sat down and we talked. And she was she had a Mamie Eisenhower bangs and in a haircut, you know, and she had this hideous dress on with the flowers and it fluffed out. I looked at the dress, my God, I couldn't believe it. And uh, she says, come right in, you know, have a seat, you know. And uh, we started talking about Hollywood and her career. And when the first time she had sex and things of that sort. Wow. I mean, she, we just had a ball talking. I was shocked. I pretend I wasn't shocked, but I was still a you kid. Were, you were like the confessor. I was still from said. Morton, Pennsylvania. Okay. We didn't talk about sex in Morton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me about that kind of thing and she talked about Joan Crawford and things of that sort. So you were really getting the early inside Hollywood uh, scoop, if you will. Oh, yes. And, she, and she, even then, in the 50s, before she did uh, uh, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, she was... Uh, Beautiful the, picture. Um, Oh God. John Crawford. And I said, what John about Miss Crawford? Crawford? Did you like her? She said, she's killed every man she's ever been with. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she says she's, she's, she's touting the idea that she's broke. She's not broke. She has money hid in the closet, under the bed, and under pillows. <laughs> you know? I said, really, Miss Davis? I believed her. <laughs> you, you were know? recording all of them? Yes. It was wonderful. Tapes? Boy, I wish I'd kept them now. You know? Yeah. And we talked about her career, you know, and George Arliss that she did, I think, one of her first films with over right. at Warner Brothers, et cetera. And so uh, uh, from that moment on, the, oh, I asked her before, we, st we, we stayed together for about an hour talking about Hollywood and her career and her lovers and, oh, and people like that. Oh, this, this is yes. George Arliss. Oh, there's George Arliss, yes, Mr. Arliss. And uh, I asked her before I left, I said, why did you commit to me uh, for an interview? She says, I had a strange feeling that you had done your homework. And I never forgot that. As nice. a reporter, you do you, you Oh, so you were a reporter at that time? Well, I was pretending to be because I wanted to meet Miss Davis. <laughs> I see. You know, so I, you I, weren't really working for inquiring minds who wanted to. Well, I knew I could sell the story. I'm sure you could. Because the Santa Monica Outlook at that time, I don't know if they, they still exist. They still exist, yes. yes. Still and they, small they bought the paper. story, and that was the beginning of my Hollywood now, writing. how much did Because I did Stringer News stories yes. in the 1800s. Yes. How much did they pay for that? Like $10? I like $10. Yeah. Like, well, $10 was a great lot It was. Money. Yeah, because I was paying $40 then. a month for my rent, well, for my, my apartment. So that was campus. a quarter of the month rent. Oh, of course it was. It was wonderful, you know. And even if they hadn't paid me anything, I would say thank you very much. Exactly. You know, for we have uh, another question from one of our actors. Z Chatters, Pepper. Oh. Agnes Moorhead. Oh, Agnes. oh What my. a genius, the chatter says. What was it like to 
meet Agnes Moorhead? Well, I first met Aggie Moorhead when I was in the script department at CBS. I was the first African American. Was this a bewitching experience? <laughs> she was powerful. I had to go there. The lady there was, she was powerful. Well, well that, she was on Bewitched. That's why I brought that up. But, yeah, but she had a radio show called uh, Mayor of the Town with John uh, with Lionel Barrymore, and I worked on that show. Really? Yeah. Which I was, was, I was Drew Barrymore's grandfather, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I uh, worked at CBS as the first African-American in the script department, and they were, I was assigned to a lot of the show. Radio show. This is radio. Were you radio. at Sunset Geller? Yeah. I worked Sunset and Geller. NBC whatever. was next, too. Oh, CBS. that's right. Yes, and the Moulin Rouge wow. was across the... Oh, it wasn't called the Moulin Rouge then. It was called... And who is this? Oh, that, oh it's Lionel oh, no, Barrymore. Lionel. Okay. Mr. Mr. Barrymore. And he was in a wheelchair even then. Oh, wow. You know, in the... Uh, this was the early 50s, yes. And... Uh, Do you feel a sense of awe or power when all these people were walking in, or these were just your peers and it was another day? Well, see, at that time, at, at, 18, yeah, at 18 years old, at that time, I, I knew they were tremendous names because listening to, listening to them on, on the radio the back radio home... The radio plays. I, you know, I was familiar with you know, the Barrymore's and all the famous names. Mm -hmm. And to be uh, here working with them, I used them as teachers. By watching, I at rehearsals, I'd be there watching them. See, I watched their attitudes, how they dealt with the scripts and how they changed, how they made the, the, uh, the lines come alive for radio at the time, you know. So it was quite wonderful. So when I, when I met Aggie uh, at CBS, she took a liking to me. She says, you go, yeah, since you're at SC, she says, I have a special class there and want to join. Oh, and nice. I said, of course, I'd love to do that. So that's how we really met. And so uh, from that time on, whatever I did, uh, she said, let me know what you're doing, and if I can help you, I will. So she does screen what tests. A she does screen tests with me. Uh, and uh, at her, uh, the studio wouldn't allow her to do She was doing the at the time. For those who don't know what a screen test is, what is that? Well, it's a testing that they give to actors or anybody they, they want to do a film right. or a TV series, and they test you. At that time, it was made uh, for film. Really. To see how the script is working and to see how you look yeah, and interact. Yeah, and angles and things right. of that sort. Blocking? Yes, and your voice, of course you know all that kind of thing and she taught me so much I mean, about how to deal she said first of all you should understand the technology of, of, of filming and she knew the lighting she knew the sound she knew it, everything she would tell people where's, where's my pen light you know things like that so she knew exactly how to deal with the guys you know, uh, behind the screen uh, behind the, the, the camera mm -hmm. I, and I admired that Miss Davis even Aggie Moorhead you know, they all knew. They, so they knew yeah. how to direct or call the shots. Oh they my weren't gosh. just and, there and she, as the puppets. And, and her gut, she felt something didn't work. But she said, I don't think that worked very well at all. Let's try to take it. Let's have another take. That kind of thing. And I listened to her. You know, even Loretta Young, she had the same thing. You know, when I met her, you know. And it was wonderful. It was a, a graduate school in, in theater and film and like dealing. Like a PhD, if you will. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. So yeah. you're acting your. Si oh, and look who this is. Oh, oh gosh, yes. Loretta. Loretta. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She always talked to me about Catholicism and religion. She says, one day you'll convert. I said, I converted myself. She says, what do you mean? I said, I believe, you know, and so many other things. Yet you are a man of sin. Yeah. Well, that's the name of my play. My, <laughs> you know, my grandmother... You uh, me when, when segue there. My, my grandmother, when uh, we were growing up listening, when my grandmother went, went to, to make a point about something. Oh, she look at your feeling sin, too. <laughs> now, what does the expression mean, I feel sin coming on? I'm about to tell you. My grandmother was responsible for us getting used to the, the, the terminology or the phrase. When she went to face somebody or a situation, if she wanted to go to the school and confront the, a teacher or a principal, she said, I feel my sin coming on. On, because she's gonna, do, she was gonna tell him, give her a piece of her mind, we'll be and, back and no matter what that was, she would uh, do that kind of thing. You know, she would confront uh, the, the situation and and let it all hang out. So to we'll speak. be back to talk more about your sin, your grandmother, <laughs> and your amazing career. You're watching actors e chat. Michael St. John is our guest, and I'm Kurt Kelly. Back in a moment in Hollywood. Uh, we are in Hollywood. And we're seeing Hollywood through the back door, through Michael St. John's eyes. Um, you were in a wedding with uh, Ethel Waters. <laughs> were you the best guy? There's a Broadway play called yes. Member of the Wedding with uh, Ethel Waters. And there she and, is. Yeah. Oh, what a lovely lady. God. Yes, she was. <laughs> well, Mom was something else. When I... Mom was someone else? That's what we ended up calling. She insisted I call her Mom. Wow. I met her. 
uh, when I was at the Ebony Showcase Theater. That was Nick Stewart, who was on Amos and Andy. He played Lightning, and he had a theater called the Ebony Showcase Theater. And uh, I became a member of that theater, and that's when I met Ethel Waters for the first time. And uh, uh, I was cast in a play called a musical called Finnegan's Rainbow. Oh, I remember. And I was dancing and playing gospel ear and doing all the other things they had me do. And Ethel, it was at the Ambassador Hotel. And uh, Ethel attended one night, and uh, I had a mishap on stage. I came out on stage, and I hadn't zipped up my trousers. <laughs> I was a little bit late, you know. You were to showing a, a whole new rainbow. Oh, it was penis power. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the audience, I never got applause. I had never gotten applause before. In that really? Scene, never. And suddenly people started, every time I'd squat, like this, people applauded. In the audience. And you had no clue. I, I knew it was a little bit of air down there. Okay. Because I really, you know, I Did really I was not something? aware of what was happening. And the lady, people were looking and laughing. And I said, my God. We're, we're, for the first time, I, I was doing the, you know, the whole scene right, it seemed. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And were so ashes going off uh, during those scenes? I, at that time, no. Okay. Yes. But then uh, the, 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 uh, the other members of the, uh, the in the scene looked at, they looked, kept dousing their eyes down and I looked at I said, my God, there I was in full, you know, playing. Full regalia. Oh, up. my God. And so, uh, after the scene, the cast was in the scene and were furious. They said, you did it on purpose. Really? <laughs> yeah, they, they, I said, no, I, I did, I thought I'd zipped up, you know. So, uh, after the, the play, Ethel Waters at the cast party. You, you had her attention. She came, she says, uh-huh. I said, we mean uh huh, Miss Miss Waters. I know what you did. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, what did I? She says, you did it on purpose. And you, so everyone truly they all that. believed it, and I did not. She says, I'd like you to appear with me. I'm having a revival of Member of the Wedding. You know. <laughs> she says, I'd like you to play Honey Camden, my half brother, the dope addicts. I said, oh, how exciting, you know. And uh, she says, but you don't try that, that bull scene again on, on me. She says, I know what you did, but I'm the star. And you don't try to steal a scene from Miss Waters. Remember, I want you in this play, because you're good. She said, but you better remember that boy. I said, okay. She said, give me a call tomorrow. She gave me a phone number, and we'll get arrange everything. So, fine. The next day, I called me, arranged everything, you know, rehearsals and everything like that. Now, at rehearsals, we had a problem. Miss Waters, because she knew everybody's partner and, and as well, because she'd been on Broadway for so long during right. the play. She sat in the audience while we were all on stage trying to do our thing with our characters. Right. She would write notes and make remarks about all of us. And was she uh, directing this play, or she just... We had a director. His name was Mr. Prick It. What? Mr. Prick It. That's what I thought you said. She took advantage of that name when she got mad. I see. So anytime she, got, didn't, she disagreed with the director, she said, Now, Mr. Prick It, I want to tell you how Mr. it should be done, Mr. Prick It. I see. And he goes frustrated because this is Ethel Waters, you know? And so uh, she complained about me so much until I got really upset about it one night at rehearsal. And I said, Miss, Miss Waters, I'm sick and tired of you sitting in that audience. Would you bring yourself up here and let me understand what kind of response I'm, I can give to you being here at rehearsal? Right. And she said, listen, you little snip. I'm the star of this play. I told you not to try, you know, to over the Upstage me. Yeah. I, I said, well, you come to stage, to come on stage. We can work together. And I start to leave. She says, I will come on the stage. So she came on stage, and she really gave me a lesson about acting. How so? And, well, she did things that only a pro would know how to move and, and how to block you. Yes, and I had to really follow her around, etc. Now, on the opening night of the play, she decided to really give me a, 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 a knockout. A true lesson. I came, made my entrance on stage, and Miss Waters, every time I opened my mouth to deliver my lines, she mimicked this. She did this. She mouthed the same thing. Oh. <laughs> and I, I looked at her. So she was like mirroring I you said, back. this bee, you know, is trying to kill me on this stage, you know. So I stopped, I stopped my dialogue, and I repeated all my dialogue again. She was furious. Because you changed <laughs> the yes, script. Yes, the audience started to applaud, you know, because they thought it was a new, refreshed way of doing the scene. Oh, you know? my. And I was supposed to kiss her on the neck after I got the money that I needed to put my dope right. and, and make my exit. Instead of kissing her on the neck, I pinched her butt so hard and I oh. ran off stage. 
<laughs> she was furious. Oh my. The curtain dropped. She said that little SOB, I will kill him. No one said as long as I've been in the theater, no one has ever pitched my ass in on the theater. The theater. Oh, you well. had her undivided attention. I ran downstairs in my dressing room and locked it. <laughs> well, what were you afraid she was I was scared of the woman, of course. <laughs> oh my. Mom was big. Mom was big. She could do a number on she my butt. She could beat you down. Oh my. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so she stood outside the door. She said, you better come out. <laughs> I'm waiting. Were you having moments I of was terror? Shaking. I was shaking. Yes. I said, what have I done? I've lost, I know I've lost a part. And she's going to kill me. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. That's what I really thought. Then suddenly she, she thought she'd better go to the dressing room and do what she had to do there. And she made, usually she had to go to the loo, you know, the, the, the restroom. And so she went there to do what she had to do. And then she got back on stage and I had to make my another entrance on stage. Yeah. So you still haven't talked to her off stage yet? Oh, no. Okay. It's terrifying. She had your undivided attention. <laughs> well... <laughs> So what happened? Well, I went back on, back on stage. Yeah, back on stage. She decides to die on stage because everybody in town knew that she wasn't feeling very well. She had gone to the hospital before, uh, you know, she started the play, the revival of the play. Now, she started walking around the stage shaking. Oh, honey. I don't know what this and that. You know, I oh, said, so she's changing script. Changing the script. I said, you oh, no idea where I said, oh, Bernice, I feel the same way. <laughs> 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 she, and I, not only that, I decided to faint on stage. You fainted. I fainted before she did. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get to the scene again. <laughs> she was absolutely livid. Because you upstaged her one more time. All the time. But when the play was over, I... I, I was was the done. crowd roaring for Oh, yes, yeah, they loved okay. it. This was a different view of Member of the Wedding that wasn't on Broadway. <laughs> you know. The new revive. I, I, exactly. So I rushed off stage and et, et cetera. And then the play ended where we were sort of good friends or whatever. But I didn't go to the cast party at her house. And she had a house in Pasadena. And Why? she was furious. I had, to, I had to go to fly to Paris to do a movie. And she uh, said that she was very hurt that I wasn't at the cast party at her house. She says I did that on purpose. But if I go to Paris, she would insisted on getting uh, a perfume Chanel number five or number nine or one of those and she says you better get that Chanel number five and I said okay, or number nine or whatever it was and I said okay because I called her probably five back then yeah I guess yeah. so they, and it was, it was it, so we, we stayed good friends nice. and that's when she wanted me to call her mom and things like that and and I uh, gave a big party for her and she told everybody that was the biggest snip she has ever worked with nice <laughs> now flight of Columbia 7 yeah. does that have anything to do with the Columbia broadcasting system no they, it was a Columbia flight itself when the seven crew members were killed oh, and, uh, and I, this is I, a play no that's a symphony symphony work that the uh, was uh, it won a, a Grammy award right Right. And uh, I was, uh, uh, and I was rather taken uh, naturally because they represented different nationalities on that on that uh, journey, and uh, they had, uh, I wrote, I composed in about four weeks, and uh, so you wrote Cher this and and uh, Jackie Stallone and, and a lot of uh, people in San Francisco, very wealthy people, mm -hmm. so they backed it, you know, and got it uh, recorded, and uh, Spielberg. And his uh, partners, they gave uh, their share. Wow, and and that's what we recorded at uh, his partner's place up there in, in Marin. And it was quite wonderful, you know. And uh, How was Cher to work with? Oh, well, she just gave me money for the thing. I see. But I, Cher is great. And Mama uh, Georgia, she's wonderful as well. Another yeah. question from an actor, yes. you chatter. One of the chatters from Florida says, can you sing a little something for us? Oh. <laughs> just Dear like goodness. a friend. Just a little a cappella thing. Okay. <clears throat> oh, Shenandoah, I'll want to see you away, rolling river. Oh, Shenandoah, I want to see you away, abound away. Cross the wide Missouri. <laughs> wow, fabulous. Now that's an Irish 
folklore yeah. song, yeah. correct? Yeah, I'm not going to say, hey, dude. early in the morning. Early yeah. in the morning, yeah. <laughs> Why did you pick that particular song of all the trillions of songs in the universe? Because I love folk music, mm -hmm. and it tells so much about a people, about a culture. And I, I and I love those very simple songs, you know, and, uh, and that's why I love George Gershwin and mm -hmm. composers like that. Tell me about your book, Hollywood Through the Back Door. Well, for years, people have been wanting me to do, uh, uh, you know, write a story and tell the different things about my life in Hollywood. Well, and it actually has actual pictures with you and yeah. people in Hollywood in the book as yeah, well and as I, the story and I, and I sort of talk about Marilyn Monroe, how I met her, and how we became friends, how she introduced me to Arthur Miller and some of the other people, you know, mm -hmm. and how I got my part as T-Bone in, in, you know, in Carmen Jones, you know, where I caught that auto premier uh, sleeping with, you know, with Dorothy There's Dandridge. There's book we're talking about uh, that yeah. people could buy. And, right, and, uh, and Shirley Booth and I, you know, having our thing, on stage, I had a all the. Oh, you had a thing with someone else on stage. <laughs> what are you? You're just I, a troublemaker I, on stage, I, aren't you? I think, in retrospect, I was awful. You know, I didn't. I, I just. I would stand up to anybody, no matter who they were, and then they were big names, etc. You know, and there's where they can find out yes, more information you know, about your book. Order before midnight. Uh, before midnight. Yeah, well, I, I was like, oh, commercial <laughs> for your book. Order before midnight, yeah. and he'll send you the DVD. No. Uh, yeah, uh, but the thing I, I like to tell about Marilyn Monroe, I didn't know who she was. Uh, Norma Jean, uh, she was just a, like a little girl at the at the studio that I, I was uh, working. I was doing some. Uh, the farm girl from. Well, Nor well, she was starring in There's No Business Like Show Business with Ethel Merman, Merman really? and Johnny Ray and Dan Daly, my buddy, and uh, Mitzi Gaynor. And I didn't well, really like... she is, Marilyn. Right. And uh, Marlon Brando told me to... Uh, I was visiting the set, and he was visiting Marilyn, but Marilyn was not on the set. She had left for, uh, to, for lunch or so. He says, I said, I want Marlon, I want to meet Marilyn. She said, he says, well, just go out to her trailer. The trailer's right, it's right outside the... Uh, the stage and tell her that you're a friend of mine and she'll, and she'll be happy to talk to you. I said, okay. So I went outside and her door was open, but no one was there. But then I saw this little girl coming towards me. She was wearing a, a white uh, leotards, white shoes, uh, her bandana white, her face was white, her hair was white, everything was white, mm. you know, and she had no makeup on, so I didn't recognize her oh, at all. Oh, really? And she says, are you lost? I said, no, I'm just looking for Marilyn Monroe. She looked, she said, why? I said, oh, Marilyn Brando told me to say hello to her. She says, well, maybe she'll come back to her dressing room. And she started giggling. <laughs> and I said, I said uh, uh, what is your name? She says, that's Norma, Norma Jean. I said, oh my God, this girl will never come to anything with a name like that. <laughs> you know, because I was 18 years old, a little punk. Sort of. right. And so she says, do you want to have lunch with me? I said, okay. And she says, I'll, I'll pay for it. I said, boy, that's, that sounds great. So she, we went to the commissary, we walked in the commissary, every eye went on the door. Now I had been in like a head of hopper's column about being in Carmen right. Johnson. I thought everybody was looking at me. They were looking at Marilyn Monroe. And you had no idea, I had no who idea. you were with her. We sat down, they kept looking and whispering. And I said, my God, you know, everybody knows who I am. My picture was in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I had an I'm attitude. I'm so famous. Which set was this on? Which studio? Uh, there's no business like show business. 20th Century Fox. Okay. Because she was starring in it. And yeah. here's that. There was Hedda. That's Hedda, yeah. And so she... Uh, During one of those yeah. famous radio shows you're talking about. Right, exactly. Uh, she always sat down and we started talking about different people in the business. And uh, she had done a picture with Robert Mitchum, uh, The River of No Return. He, and he said uh, that he would never work with him again. Really? Uh, because it was difficult. He was difficult with her, you know. <laughs> and I said, really? And so uh, uh, she says, I got to get back. I said, why? She said, I got to get my costume on. I took my costume off for the next scene. So she says, I'll see you there. I said, okay, great. Well, uh, she went and she left, finished her sandwich, went, left the oh, commissary. There's, there's return. Yeah. yeah. No she left the, no return. Right. She left the, the commissary. And I looked around the room. And you still had no idea? No idea at all. Okay. Uh, she, she left, and then the, the, I looked around the, the, com the, the commissary. No one was looking at that in my direction at all now. No one was whispering anymore. No one was even whispering. Nothing. Oh, my. I was insulted. I said, fame is really, you know, very short lived. Yeah, sound. short lived. Darn. So I left and went back towards the stage where they were shooting the film, and I heard people laughing in her trailer, Marilyn's trailer. I said, oh, there she is. I can see her. I went up to her there. Uh, Johnny Ray was sitting in the doorway. <laughs> and he was laughing. And uh, I went up to her. I looked at her. I 
I said, oh my God. She says, there he is. There he is. You know, and they all start laughing about it, you know. And I said, how could you do that to me? She said, because you were so cute and you oh, didn't know nice. who I was, you know. Johnny Ray. Yeah, Johnny Ray. Boy, we had some times too together. Uh, but, uh, and so she, from that time on, she, uh, we had a, a wonderful friendship. And no matter when she was in town, she always gave me a call. Or, oh, how nice. Or left a message on my, you know, machine or so. It was quite, quite wonderful. A question from an actor you chatter. Yes. One of our chatters from back east asks, what's it like to wear so many hats? I mean, actor, dancer, author, friend of celebrities, a celebrity yourself. How? Well, does, I, it, does it mess up your hair wearing those many hats? No, I'll tell you what it does. It keeps me going because, let's face it, to come to town and just concentrate on being an actor is really is a stupid thing to do because I, it, that's, I decided to look to write to dance to sing uh, to do everything I possibly could to keep alive because I knew darn well that, uh, that I couldn't do Shakespeare at that time uh, because I, even though I'd done Otello at college, uh, you know, at USC, I'd done some other classical things, but I knew the, the reality of it. I just had to simply concentrate on doing other things, you know, the composing the music, uh, playing the piano, doing all of those things. I just had to do it. That's why I decided to write a column. That way I would meet more celebrities, meet more directors and producers who might be able to, to help me in, in my quest to, uh, to be something, you know. We'll be back with more with Michael St. John. You're watching Actors Eat Chat Live from Hollywood. I'm Kurt Kelly. So, Michael, um, Mary Pickford, instrumental how? Well, when I left... Uh, this is Mary, right? Oh, uh, that's Miss Pickford. When I left the CBS from the script department, a, a, a psychic uh, a friend of hers, a Dr. Samuel Heiliger, you did say psychic. See, he was a so psychic. He was her okay. personal psychic as well. Mm -hmm. He he helped people like Chriswell. There used to be a guy called Chriswell Predicts, and on television he did. He was always on those that that uh, midnight show at the time, a twelve o'clock show. You know, late show like the Johnny Carson show. Right. And so uh, he, uh, uh, I, he, I was introduced to him, and he introduced me to his to Mary Pickford. They seemed to grow up together. Uh, her mother, Miss Pickford, brought him uh, from the islands oh, to to uh, Chris, to New Chris York. Well uh, yes, exactly. And from the coffin. <laughs> yes, and yes, he was spooky. Uh, <laughs> and Miss Pickford uh, liked me very much because I was singing at one of their parties that they were giving. They had a lot of. Uh, Party slot that involved a Debbie Reynolds. A whole Ren different time in Different time. Debbie Reynolds, Barbara Roick, and people like that. And uh, Miss Pickford wanted to ask me to work with her uh, in, a, in producing a show, a fashion show. And she, it was a, a celebrity kind of thing. So she wanted me to. Uh, for a charity? Or for just charity, for a charity. Okay. Like one of those Hollywood uh, type charities, you know? Right. And uh, so I said, okay, Debbie wonderful. Reynolds. Yes, it was Debbie. I mean, she was 18 years old. Not in that picture. Oh, she not, had to at least be 19. Uh, I'm 19, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, she, I was supposed to, uh, we, we, she asked me to call Jane Russell and all these people, marvelous stars at the time, and get them to the celebrity Jane thing. Russell. And they all said, yes, 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 because it's Mary Pickford. You right. Know? So she... Uh, we, we had rehearsals and we got the show together and, uh, and she said would you wait for me for my, at the limousine you can Shane escort Russell. me yes yes Miss Russell she said would you uh, escort me into the theater at the, at the Pan Pacific we used to be I don't know if you remember that or not it used, it used, right close, used to be very close to CBS television and I said okay Up fine Sunset uh, no. Beverly. I'm Beverly. I'm, okay, thank well, you. we're at television thank, city. thank you okay and, and so uh, uh, to get it going uh, I I uh, was there waiting for Miss Pickford uh, for the that, uh, for the show, and she was a little bit late. And so when a limo came up, she got out of the limo, and the lights were on, et cetera, and her underwear was showing. And I so said, she had learned that football from was, you. She was drinking. <laughs> I see. Mary Pickford was had a problem. I didn't realize it. Oh. So when she got out of the car, I said, Miss Pickford, your drawers are hanging. She says, My what? I see your drawers from, from Pennsylvania. We call it drawers. <laughs> Close the drawer. <laughs> and I had not changed from anything else. She says, well, do something about it. I said, <laughs> in front I, of a whole audience. Nice. She whispered to me, do something about it. 
she was like, you know, she's a little prissy little lady, you know. Right. I said, I'll get you to the dressing room. All right. She says, fine. Are they still hanging? I said, oh, Miss Pickford is terrible. Went to the dressing room. She says, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to pin your drawers up. She said, why do you call them drawers? I said, well, that's my grandmother called them drawers. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I got under the, her, I, I was under her dress, rules. pinning her drawers up. And suddenly she says, she started laughing. I said, why are you laughing, Miss Pickford? She says, this idea. How a scandal it would be if someone opened the door and saw you under my under my my dress, pinning my drawers out. I said, what a scandal it would be if you were on stage and and uh, the America's sweetheart's drawers be hanging in front of the whole world. Oh she my. says, you have a point. That she stopped laughing. You know. So we, we had a wonderful time together. You know. Now before we run out of time, you also said you wanted to talk about Juanita Moore. Juanita Moore. Oh yes, Juanita Moore. God bless her. She passed uh, in the, in the first of January. And, and here uh, she is. Yes, I mean she was known for *Imitation of Life*. She's one of the uh, the black actresses who received an Oscar nomination Iconic. for that role. Yes, exactly. And I met her when I was a kid at the Ebony Showcase Theater. She was my teacher. She guided me. She gave me hell when I did things wrong or told me like when I talked too much. She says you talk too much or I told you not to say this. Why just wow. listen to me? Wow, it's good and, to have those mentors. Though. Yes, and, I, and uh, many years later, I asked her to <laughs> appear in my my play, and she was so taken by it. And she says that's a wonderful thing for you to do. I love the play, Michael. And uh, during rehearsal, uh, you know, she uh, was really excited about, you know, doing, uh, having the reading. We were right. having a reading at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. And so Great I called her, I, yes, then I got a call and telling me right after the second week that she had a heart attack and died. Oh. So I, I dedicated, the, you know, to uh, the play to Juanita Moore. And, you know, the, 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 I feel sin coming on because she was aware of that thing as well. When she was a little girl, she told me. Fabulous. So it's a lot of warm memories. Well, you've shared many warm memories, Michael, and uh, I truly am blessed to have had the time with you here today. I feel sin coming on. So is that the actual URL that people can go to? Oh, I yes. feel sin coming on dot com yes. or I feel sin. Yeah, I, I feel sin coming on dot com or whatever. I think they would and come here up here. You quickly. are on uh, your confidential file. What? What? Your confidential. That's file? in the Canyon News okay. in Beverly Hills. Your confidential <laughs> file on Facebook. And here you are on Twitter at St. John Michael for those who are keeping score and on Amazon. Don't forget to buy the book and uh, support his illustrious career.